welcome. Uh, for those of you out there who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm the executive chairman of Zien, and we run a huge number of communities uh, around the world. And today we're hosting one of our community members, George Littlejohn. George Littlejohn is very much at the core of so much that we do uh, here uh, in the city of London that I'm delighted he's taken time off of his busy schedule at home, at home as we all are, uh, to come in uh, and have a chat with us today about things that are interesting and important in his life. Uh, there's a lot I could say about George, but George is uh, very much um, uh, a person that we have done a lot of work with over the years. This has ranged from, believe it or not, George writing poetry for us, uh, us doing a game together with George to teach young people about share trading. We, we had a, several hundred young people uh, go through that program. And we've written articles together, helped publish books, and we've also conducted a number of webinars and seminars together. But today we're here to talk about you, George, uh, and, and, and your life. Um, I, I hope this doesn't come out quite like this is your life or Room 101, but there is an element to that. We would just like to feature things that guests in our community find useful and helpful. So George, um, we had a little structure here that I uh, pulled together with you over the last 36 hours. Uh, and what I'd like to cover uh, for, for a lot of you out there is a, a few things that would maybe give you a bit of insight into George and the things that interest him. Now, one of the things is that George is a global ambassador. Uh, every time I try and get hold of George, he's either at an airport or so exhausted just going back from an airport. Uh, and he's been spending a tremendous amount of time in a whole variety of places where the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment operates. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Chartered Institute for Securities Investment has approximately um, 45,000 members all over the world, and George flies constantly uh, keeping that community together. In a declaration of conflict of interest, I should point out that FS Club is a Chartered Institute for Securities Investment CPD provider. Uh, so those of you who are SISI members can get points just for watching George talk, uh, and me for that matter. Uh, and I also happen to be uh, an honorary, uh, ch chartered honorary member of that organization myself. So conflicts of interest out of the way. But George, uh, in our discussion about uh, what we might cover today, um, I asked you, what was the most surprising thing that you've come across? Well, Michael, thank you. And thank you for your kind words. And I feel honored and privileged to be on this, this great program, especially on this beautiful Monday, Thursday, the day before Easter in uh, sunny London, even though we're all trapped in our houses by the lockdown. Um, you asked me where I'd last gone on business before the lockdown, and it was just before Christmas to Kazakhstan, to the capital, Nur Sultan, which is now uh, the, the new name for Astana, the former name. And I was there as a guest of our very good mutual friend, Professor Alexander van der Putte, whom I think is watching this from Nur Sultan right now, being somewhat trapped there by the virus. Um, and Alexander had organized a, a really rather wonderful and doubly surprising competition for young Kazakhs looking at how the country could build itself as a proper global financial center, rather reflecting all the work that you, Michael, and your colleagues have done over, goodness, nearly 15 years now on the Global Financial Centers Index and related areas. And I was candidly expecting to be a judge on a slightly uh, worthwhile, worthy almost, prosaic essay competition, but not a bit of it. Firstly, of the dozen or so shortlisted uh, essays, all of them could have been winners. It was very, very hard indeed to choose between them. Really bright, young and youngish Kazakhs had written some really thoughtful and meaningful material about what the country might do in the future at the center of this great, wealthy, sometimes troubled region. But the great surprise was that the real judging happened during a Pecha Kucha competition. And Pecha Kucha is possibly one of the best inventions um, I've ever come across. For those who don't know it, it was invented by some Japanese architecture students and their teachers nearly 20 years ago. And it was to stop people firstly writing epic essays, which someone has to read. And secondly, to stop people doing epic PowerPoint presentations. I think we've all grown to loathe uh, the man, and he's always a man, who turns up saying, I know I've only got 10 minutes, but I've got 300 slides here, so I'll try to rattle through them quickly. Petra Kucha is a very different presentation system. It gives you 20 slides and 20 seconds on each slide to make your point. No more, no less. And it's a great way of getting information over quickly. And the two winners, two Yelenas, whom you will see shortly on CISI TV and I hope on uh, Financial Services Club uh, website as well, did a fantastic presentation 
on a wonderfully prescient presentation on uh, bonds in the new economy. What would happen if something dreadful happened in the world and how would we finance a reconstruction when that happened? And sure enough, I'm sure not planned by the two lovely Yelenas, uh, this has come about. So that was my big surprise. An essay competition where I actually wanted to continue reading after the first couple of hours. And secondly, where I wanted to continue watching uh, the great presentations. Here are the two Yelenas on screen uh, doing their Petra Kucha six minutes, 40 seconds presentation. Excellent stuff, highly recommended. Sounds like we have a lot to learn from uh, Astana or Nul Sautan. Uh, maybe not rebranding, but <laughs> a lot about brevity. That's that's excellent. Actually, George, just a little bit of insight. What, what, what was behind that name change and how's it going down? Well, um, the, 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 the first president um, of Kazakhstan, um, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, resigned uh, about a year ago, last May, and the country decided to name the capital, which had been Pardon me, not a real cough, just a tickle in the throat. Uh, the, the capital of, Almaty, of, of Kazakhstan had been Almaty, a rather wonderful city in the mountains in the far east of the country. But mm. firstly, um, Almaty is uh, very far from the center of the country. And secondly, it's a wee bit earthquake prone. So they decided to move it to uh, what was then a small town and is now called Astana, which means capital, uh, right in the center of the country. It's, it's a glorious city with many monumental buildings. Um, but when the president stepped down, they decided it would be a good idea to rename it um, Nur Sultan after their uh, first founding president, after um, uh, the, the departure from the Soviet Union. Um, I think that's caused a wee bit of confusion um, over the Astana International Financial Center, with which we both have strong connections, because I think some people are not aware that Astana and Nur Sultan are effectively the same thing with a new bit of badging. And I know a lot of work is happening, even as we speak, uh, to help with that. Yes, so uh, here we are with our little first community chess prize. Is it Astana or Nul Sohan that has won second prize in the beauty contest? And actually, it's been kind of interesting because uh, Almaty and Nur Sultan do vie, don't they? Oh, anyway, sure. yeah. uh, George, I asked you another question, which is, you know, what was the most thought-provoking thing uh, that you've been up to lately? Well, you know, what I've been doing, even before, because my travels were somewhat curtailed even before the... Um, uh, um, the, the, the lockdown. And we don't like to talk about, about that thing. incident, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading quite a lot. I've been reading. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. But this wonderful book. This is the cheap press copy. But um, great. Oh, you got to hold, hold it up a little bit clearly. Your fingers are blocking it for those. Who... Alrighty. No, there you now, go. This Thank is not you. the real cover. This is the this is the cheap old press version. But uh, John Kay, eminent Scottish economist, brilliant man, and Mervyn King, Lord King, former governor of the Bank of England. Uh, who ran the bank through the, the last financial crisis, we have a new one coming, have written <laughs> this great book, their first in 40 years, called Radical Uncertainty. Let me come back to this in a minute. I've You've got a lot of post-it notes on that. Oh, yeah. Look, um, this is, this is called research. Like, oh, research. my gosh. Oh, research. Um, okay. I've also been reading a book, a really terrific book, again, by a good friend of Michael's and mine, Alex Edmonds from London Business School, Grow the Pie. And this focuses on issues around culture. Why are we all in business? We all know that in Britain, the Financial Conduct Authority has done great work recently with the help of professional bodies like the CISI on purpose in finance. And Alex is a great guru on this. So Grow the Pie, highly recommended. You can read about it at growthepie.net. Andy Haldane, chief economist at the Bank of England, hard man to please, said Edmund's superb book makes the case compellingly and comprehensively for a radical rethink of how companies operate and indeed why they exist. It's a tour de force. That's high praise from a great Actually, man. I'll add, I'll add to that if I might. Uh, Alex is a fellow Gresham professor, and those of you who are interested in his thinking uh, at gresham.ac.uk, you will find a huge host of uh, transcripts and lectures that he's done over the last uh, over the last two years. Really superb presenter as well. He's a stunning speaker, really great. And he will be, for CISI members, he will be appearing on CISI TV shortly. He was actually due to launch that book um, at our premises a couple of weeks ago, but alas, mm. the virus, which we don't talk about, got in the way. I've also been reading some more light reading, this wonderful new translation by an American academic of The Art of War by Sun Zhu. Um, it's just a wonderful book. It's for dipping into, and it's it explains enormously why some of the past translations have been pretty desperately wrong. Um, mm. There's never 
I'm never far from, on a lighter note, a Robert McFarlane book. Robert McFarlane is probably the best, um, one of the best writers in the world today, a Cambridge academic who's extremely fit. We all hate him, uh, but he writes some stunning stuff. This is a latest, rather small volume, but Robert McFarlane, great. A you just like him because he's got a Scottish surname. That's your thing. <laughs> okay, the new He's Scottish, of course. I've been reading a terrific book, not my normal uh, reading material, by one of your fellow um, country persons, Anya Seaton, from many moons back, um, a great book called Catherine, which is about the relationship between Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt. Not my normal stuff, but a great tale. And I'm going to come back to my final book in a minute, um, which is um, by Jesse Norman, not the dead opera singer, but the, uh, the Treasury Minister. But the, the book by John Key and Mervyn King is, is surprisingly stimulating. Two economists, and I've got a degree in ec economics myself. Economics is indeed a dry science, but John and Mervyn have managed to make it immensely stimulating. Um, Anthony Hilton introduced um, a talk recently by John. In fact, our last live talk at the CISI at, at uh, Willis uh, on the 11th of March. And when Anthony read it, just out in one take, um, he found it tremendous. You'll find that video of John's talk then on the um, Financial Services Club website and, of course, on the CISI website. So I can't recommend this book by John and Mervyn more highly. Is that an off sales pitch? That's a great one. And uh, that turns us to probably the, the subject we'd really like to kind of get our teeth into. You know, what's top of your intray? What's 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 making it tick? What's uh, what are you finding uh, the most interesting project you've got of the many that you've got underway, let alone the many books you're trying to get through? Well, John Kay, who may well be watching this, is certainly um, Scotland's greatest living economist. In fact, possibly the best microeconomist alive in the world today. But the man here in the middle, um, standing in front of Smokey Kirkcaldy, where he was born, is, of course, Adam Smith, um, widely regarded as being possibly the greatest economist ever to live. Some people, maybe John, would doubt that, but many don't. The, the Jesse Norman book that I mentioned earlier, um, a biography of Adam Smith, published two years ago, is really quite exceptional um, in portraying not just the man, um, who was hardworking but a wee bit lazy at times, and he missed some points because he maybe didn't travel around his native Scotland quite enough, but a really perceptive economist, philosopher. And he had views which were um, perhaps not those which people would, many people these days would regard as um, Adam Smith's views. He wrote Wealth of Nations 13 years after he wrote his, his other major book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And moral sentiments is really all about how People care for other people. The very first page is about how men and women find it hard to walk past someone who's in trouble without at least concerning themselves with that person's oh, yeah. trouble or doing something about it. Um, uh, it should be read in conjunction with Wealth of Nations, of course, which is capitalism read in tooth and claw, but the two together paint a very different picture. Now, I think I owe a major debt to Adam Smith. Am I allowed to tell the story, Michael? Do we have time? Yes, definitely. It's one of the funnier ones. Uh, very briefly, I uh, did quite a lot of journalism at university, but the book reading stuff did actually escape me a bit. And I got a rather better degree than I might have been expected to get through a few strokes of luck. One of which for my final paper was that when I turned up to write um, a three hour paper, one question, sight unseen, choice of four, all my friends and colleagues were reading books. And I thought it was a bit too late for me. So I read a copy of that day's Times newspaper. We got it cheap as students still a very good newspaper, of course. Um, and there was a reprint of a speech in that by Vic Feather, then head of the Trades Union Congress, um, who had done a talk uh, two days beforehand in Smith's native Kirkcaldy, um, celebrating the great man's, uh, the 250th anniversary of his birth. And Vic Feather was talking about um, what Adam Smith would have thought about modern trade, trades unionists. Yeah, and yeah. Bobby, I walked into the exam room, and the first question on this um, blind Four question paper was what would Adam Smith have thought of modern day trade unionists and the academic thought told me afterwards how brilliant this was and said where did these thoughts come from and I said oh you know just natural brilliance so I got a better degree than planned so I have always owed Adam Smith a great debt and I and some chums in Scotland but also in various places around the world including Kazakhstan we've mentioned in, in Russia yeah. in Northern Ireland in France in California are planning um, a global um, challenge for students, groups of students, teams of students, to ask what would Adam Smith have thought of the climate challenge? Um, there was no climate challenge when he was a lad or even a grown man. Kirkcaldy was a bit smoky, but nothing like um, the problems we face in the world today. He taught um, 
economics at Glasgow University. Um, Glasgow was meant until recently to be host of COP26, uh, but yeah. we will be continuing with this with a strong link to Glasgow and the university. And you will be reading about this more shortly on my Twitter feed at G Little John and on many websites um, around the world. We're going to use Petra Kucha, of course, this simple method of presenting things online to get some social networking going and to get some voting by young people around the world on what they want to tell us rather than what we, the oldies, want to tell them about the climate challenge. Um, but we just uh, have them still with us to guide us here. Small little digression, uh, but your, uh, or even a little small digression, your um, uh, thoughts on COP26 in 30 seconds. You know, it was going to be up there in Glasgow. Um, I, I was very confused about what was being proposed, if anything. Uh, but we've now had this delay, and we should be capable, I think, of producing a pretty darn good COP26. Uh, what do you think, though, we could get out of it? It's, uh, it, there was nothing beforehand really presaging what people honestly wanted, except to have 30,000 people fly in to, to Glasgow uh, for climate change. Uh, did you have any idea? Certainly Glasgow, my native Glasgow, did seem a bit of an odd place to choose for a conference on climate change, because the climate in Glasgow is usually the same, it's always raining. But I think, actually, that given what's happening just now, and the time we have for reflection about some real dangers facing the world, I mean, on this very screen, Recently, I was looking at my um, two grandchildren in, in Edinburgh, one three and one um, not quite one yet, and thinking, actually, it's not me or you, Michael, with respect, who are going to be paying for the cost of what's going on just now, or our children, but it's our grandchildren are going to be picking up the bill for all of this. And mm. the truth is that if you look at this sort of, I saw a cartoon the other day, I think in the New Yorker, um, of the sombrero of uh, the virus and two scientists looking at this saying goodness i'll be glad when this is over but then behind them is this huge wave which is the climate uh, threat yeah, uh, yeah. which will come to haunt us by the summertime again and my sense is that oh, of course it's sad that glasgow is not hosting the event in in, um, in november but it'll give us more time to reflect on what could go horribly wrong and this is the worst thing any of us watching this most of us alive today have ever faced in our lives um, but the climate change could be could be far worse. So I, and I think we now realize the problems we face. Yeah, there's this uh, famous Amara's law often attributed to Gates, but it does the rounds that, you know, technology goes uh, slower than you think over two or three years and faster than you think over 10. Uh, we had a session today with uh, Alistair MacLeod. It seems to be Scotland Day for us here. Uh, good, at, good. At the FS Club, uh, who is uh, talking about uh, gold uh, and silver, principally gold, taking over from fiat currency, because in his words, he was looking at that very long term trend we've had of um, people um, sort of, you know, debasing the currency. It was quite shocking, actually, as he, he chose a log scale and you're looking at sort of reduction to about 2% of uh, the value of the currency over just a few decades. Um, but it was this bit that now he's predicting this will go over the cliff edge. Uh, you, you know, you're talking about going over uh, the cliff edge on climate change. And here we've been looking at a pandemic uh, pretty clearly. Uh, you know, we had SARS 17 years ago, so we knew it was possible. We knew, knew it would come and we did nothing about it for a very long aching period of time. And then suddenly, you know, over the cliff edge. And we're not, we're not very good at uh, long term cliff edges and, and staying away from them. No, indeed. In fact, there's a, a, a rather alarming piece coming in the next issue of the CISI Review magazine, which is about the price of housing in the UK, written by another fellow of the Institute, a fellow fellow of Michael's, Keith, Keith Robertson, um, which um, mentions in a postscript he wrote post uh, the virus, the problem that we face, which is that this is not the last virus, when as long as we um, live for a, just a few more years, something like this is going to come up again. Um, yeah. So we should be learning the lessons like mad just now. And indeed, Gordon Brown has been making this point recently alongside his, his views on the need for a, a linked up global approach to this challenge uh, mm. to learn lessons as rapidly as possible so that when it, when it comes again, we're ready to, to face it. Yeah. We've been involved um, for the past couple of years um, with um, some Russian colleagues, the Foreign Office, uh, British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, very kindly agreed to pay for the translation of our entry level exams into Russian. And they've been deployed in a massive uh, competition sponsored by Bank of Russia, which is highly regarded by 
West, East, and everyone, a strong, independent, powerful, respected body um, called the Financial Olympiad, run by our good friend, Dr. Igor Kostikov, former chairman of the security regulator in Russia. Um, this year, we had about 80,000 um, entrants for it. It's been slightly stymied by the, the virus, but we'll get around those problems by summertime. But one key thing in trying to move the age group down from school leavers ages to, to uh, younger senior, people, pe senior school people and primary people is the importance of compound interest. This comes back to your um, oh, yeah. issue earlier about economies. Yeah. And um, our sense is that if you can explain to people how compound interest works, you can explain an awful lot about what can go very right in investment matters and in global politics and in science and what can go very wrong. So in other words, if you understand that uh, financing your um, wedding, let's say, on a credit card is not a good idea because of compound interest, you begin to understand it. If you understand how the virus spreads, these great things we've all seen around the world in recent weeks of um, how isolation can stop viruses spreading, you really begin to understand a lot of the problems and the opportunities facing the world. That was a long 30 seconds, sorry. A very important 30 seconds, actually. Now, George, um, uh, tell us just uh, briefly, and I do be briefly, you're, you've got this Adam Smith challenge coming up. Uh, yep. What's the winner get? Uh, the winner will get bursaries. It's quite in, the, the financing is interesting because it's being uh, supported by people around the world from uh, a couple of trust funds at present to a couple of local councils in Britain, one in Northern Ireland, one in Scotland, who are going to give scholarships to the teams who win them. So they'll be, it's very much locally based. There'll be a global winner, but locally based, and the funding will come locally. So it's not some grand glittering prize from a grand foundation or whatever. We hope to persuade one of them to do precisely that. But um, it's, it's based on uh, local communities supporting their young people, students of any age, frankly, but we hope it's going to be mostly uh, school, senior school students and uh, undergraduates, maybe master's students, working as teams. That's the key thing. Nothing much works in the world without teams, and we need different people to give their different views. So they will get a decent scholarship prize, and there might be some good fun bits to be added onto it when the prize is awarded in November. And what we rather hope is that the elections uh, at Glasgow University to make uh, the blessed Greta Thunberg, the rector, the first student rector of Glasgow University, will take place, and she might be around either sailing across the North Sea or electronically to give uh, the awards down the wires. Oh, good, good, good. Yes, the Greta and the good. Uh, <laughs> good one. Um, now, uh, just to tell us, uh, we're kind of coming to the end of uh, of our session. Uh, nothing urgent, but uh, just uh, what was the funniest thing you've been involved in lately? Well, it's very serious, Michael. On the 1st of April, when so many serious things have been launched over the years, and fewer this year than most years, um, you came up with a brilliant idea you'd originally developed um, about a decade ago, I guess. Yep. <laughs> uh, with Cisco, um, I believe, which was to launch chair miles. Uh, now, we all sort of fly around the world a bit and collect air miles and so on. But in this modern world, we have to ask whether people really want to be uh, jumping on airplanes all the time and, and dumping carbon in the atmosphere. Great talk a month ago, um, oh, six weeks ago, by James Bardrick, who runs City in this time zone, at a wonderful conference org organized by our friends at City and Financial called Women in Finance. There were 200 women in the room and five men, three of us in the audience, James Bardrick from City speaking in the first session on a panel with three women and Michael Colfontaine, our chairman um, of CISI and of AFME. And James made the point, and he used the word blokes here advisedly. He said, firstly, he realized that City was probably the biggest, one of the biggest dumpers of carbon in the atmosphere because of the numbers of people flying around. And secondly, did people really want um, a bunch of blokes turning up off the front of a plane with a bunch of pitch books trying to sell them something they perhaps didn't really want. And so we've got to reconsider the way we do things. So Michael's great idea solves this problem by instead of offering air miles, offering chair miles. So you can earn chair miles by sitting on your bottom and doing decent things. Is that a reasonable summary of your sales pitch, Michael? Yeah. Anyway, the folks can go and have a quick look at it. It's 90 seconds uh, if they feel like it. Now, George, you're going to find this uh, interesting. I mean, this is the funniest thing for me. Uh, we've actually got questions. Oh my well, gosh. Uh, so I'll begin a bit of Q&A here for you. Um, not going to take these in any particular order, but uh, Tim Coleman probably is the the first one here. I'm having a little just difficulty making it out. It's not Tim's fault. It's me. Um, yeah, he's, he points out uh, that David Graeber, have you read David Graeber's debt, the first yep. 5,000 years, disagrees with um, Adam Smith on his perspective on bartering systems. 
Uh, do you agree with one or the other? Uh, and do you think this uh, current coming crisis might send us into a barter, bartering style economy? Well, you know, I'm, firstly, I obviously agree with Adam Smith. He's Scottish, so I would agree with him for jingoistic reasons. But I'm not sure we're going to return to that. I, there's a great um, paper just been issued by the wonderful David Birch, um, great technology friend of Michael's, mine, and indeed the world's, uh, just published last week by the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation on Digital Currencies. And I think I'm, I'm no great or I have been no great believer in digital currencies, but my views are changing. And I speak with great trepidation here in front of Michael and some people in this audience today. But I think Dave could persuade me that digital is the way ahead and that we do not have to return to barter, that Adam Smith got the sense of why money matters right, and also about why um, money works as a method of exchange. If you speak to primary school children in particular, they do get to understand about why it is that a piece of plastic can be used to provide them with um, ice lollies um, in my limited experience of primary school children in recent years. Yeah. Well, it's funny, actually, when, Michael, we, were, uh, well, when we started uh, on the Eternal Coin Project, uh, I got a lot of people complaining to me that uh, children couldn't understand uh, things. And we, uh, we were doing some stuff. You remember we brought out that paper together on confidence accounting about uh, six, seven mm -hmm. years ago. It was just before that. Somebody said, oh, kids wouldn't understand confidence accounting it's too complicated because you're asking people to express things in ranges uh, so i did what i should do i went and asked some kids so I, I gave them a mythical lemonade stand i said you've run it for a day and then you you've got left over you know six lemons and uh the stand and you pay five quid a day for the stand and you know, so they could see the situation you know how much is your business worth and they were right away on to well it all depends you know if it's a sunny day tomorrow the lemons will sell or they won't sell and you know, lemon prices might go up or down. So why are you asking me such a specific question? And yet uh, accountants, you know, very confidently, you know, pronounce things down. Oh, ha, ha, ha. We rounded this uh, one billion pound company to the nearest thousand. But, you know, the kids grasped that it was uh, it, it was a much broader range than that, uh, as I think a lot of businesses are discovering in coronavirus. You know, how, how well can you take a kind of a three month hiatus? And what does that do to you? So, yeah, it's, it's not an easy one. Um, now, somebody else here wondered if uh, social distancing applies to boats. And that, that question was directed at me, I think, to make me go back out on the water. But George, you've got a bit of a sailing background too, don't you? I was all, delighted yesterday in the chairing of the risk committee of a, a theater college of which I'm a, a governor to see a picture of one of our um, colleagues who's wheelchair bound on a boat. And I thought, oh, terrific, there that. she is sailing. Um, and discussing risk. In fact, it was a photograph. It was not the real thing. She was in her flat like the rest of us. Um, I, I think, alas, social distancing um, will stop most of us um, sailing for some time. And if this is who I think it is, I think a broken leg will also be uh, um, a problem as well in the short term. Yeah. And Paul, if it is you, I wish you well. <laughs> George, I uh, I had one uh, one final question. Well, not a question. I, one of one of my favorite stories I've heard from you over the years is your one about uh, Little John Fraser and your family genealogy. Can can you slip that in in fifty seconds or something? Fifty seconds briefly. I used to be a trustee of a charity called Merlin, um, which is now part of Save the Children, a medical relief charity, and many on this call I suspect donated to it. And thank you. Um, our auditors were a firm called Little John Fraser. Um, the last Little John died in eighteen ninety eight. But the US aid agency, which gave us a lot of money, did not um, believe me um, that I was not related to it and to sign deposition saying I wasn't. Um, but after getting quite a lot of money out of them, a third of our money, many, many millions of pounds in the early days when that mattered hugely, obviously a million pounds still mattered to charities. Um, we discovered, I discovered through a bit of um, inheritance of someone who died in test season five, whom I didn't know, that in fact, the senior partner of a four stage little John Fraser was one of my old mates from my early days at Price Waterhouse, where we qualified as chartered accountants together. So, in fact, when I had been telling the U.S. government, whom I hope are not watching this, that I had no connection whatsoever with little John Fraser, apart from a friendship with this chap who was then a, a, a relatively junior partner. In fact, we're reasonably closely related. Our grannies were sisters, but in the Scottish way, they'd obviously fallen apart. So that's my little John story. And as I understand it, uh, you inherited a little bit and, and got a free certificate of uh, genealogy. 
Oh, the great thing about it was you know, inherited a bit, yeah. so it was, it was Bond's money. But the main thing uh, was was the family tree, which I'd never really bothered looking at. But it was fascinating yeah. to see how we'd spread our tentacles around the world. Love it. Love it. Well, look, folks, uh, it's been just a nice way to end, uh, as George indicated, on a Maundy Thursday and hot cross buns looming and everything else like that. Uh, we're delighted, George, that you were able to join us for Communities Chest and get a few things off your chest. And we look forward to working with you and having more fun with you over many decades to come. Uh, may I take this opportunity to thank as well our uh, listeners. And uh, I hope that all of you, too, enjoy a good weekend uh, ahead uh, and uh, pick pick a place exotic like, you know, the, the second bedroom or or something. And we, we hope you have a really good time and, uh, and, and look forward to seeing you uh, again at another webinar soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Michael, thank you. And thank you all for watching and have a great weekend. And as they say, stay safe. Good. Thank you.